So um, let me um, start just by asking you, we're now um, 10 years after the financial crisis. Uh, how are the regulators doing? How are you feeling about the relative state of safety and fairness in the financial system? Uh, pretty mixed. Um, and, and one, first I'll just say to Professor Barta, thanks for having uh, all of us here. And it's a real pleasure to be making sure we're doing these reflections 10 years after the fact. Uh, I, my, I have a few observations on this. Is One major strength that I see uh, in the right direction is we have some very energetic state attorneys general and banking regulators who are outspoken about not letting what happened uh, what happen again. They do not want to be preempted. They do not want to sit on the sidelines uh, while things go awry. So that is a, a major strength. Obviously, we are both a little biased on this, but a major strength at least we have a CFPB, um, and that is something that is not ever going to go away, uh, and we will make sure of that. Uh, but you know, there's some mixed mixed evidence too on how some of our other banking regulators are, are doing. You know, if we look at at the macro picture of low unemployment, like we're seeing now. Why are we seeing the type of delinquency in auto lending? Why are we seeing such ongoing trouble in student lending? And when we peel back one layer of the onion, there's a lot of troubles. And, and I'm not so sure uh, all of our regulators are on the game on that. And, and that, that worries me. And that worries me that we are not prepared uh, as well as we could be for the next recession, which, which I don't know when will come, but it will come. So maybe I'll push you a little bit on the regulatory question. So um, you noted the rise of um, actions by state AGs and state regulators. Uh, there seems to be a diminution in enforcement at the CFPB, at least in the early numbers we're seeing. Uh, is the FTC up to the task of, of filling in? You know, what's the role of the OCC and the FDIC and the Fed? What, are, are they being aggressive enough? How do you see at the federal level the interaction among the regulators? Well, let me be unambiguous. The FTC cannot fill the gap. We are not resourced to do so. We do not have nearly the expertise in terms of the range of resources and, and authorities as the CFPB. Where, where, and I'm happy to talk about this more, there are places where the FTC has a unique role to play but it should not be seen as the backstop for you know, a weakening enforcement agenda of the CFPB. So obviously what we see at the federal level is of great concern to me uh, because it is a signal to the marketplace uh, that you, know, you can go closer to the line um, and even cross the line, uh, and you can make a business decision to cross the line. And uh, if, even if you are caught, maybe they're won't be much consequences at all. And, and what I want to underscore on that is this is deeply unfair to law-abiding financial firms. So you see a lot of financial firms who are actually wanting to follow the law. And guess who is most harmed uh, you know, by, by their peers and competitors breaking the law then? Uh, and that's, that's just fundamentally unfair. This is not just about protecting consumers, but for every law-abiding business, they should be angry about what is about weakening enforcement uh, writ large. So Rohit, let me ask you to uh, poke in in some depth on a couple of areas. Um, and maybe we'll start um, in the um, auto loan market. Um, as most of you know, the there was a tussle in the legislative process, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, was stripped of its authority back in the um, debate over Dodd-Frank uh, to write rules for auto dealers um, with respect to their lending practices. Uh, but in a strange twist of fate <clears throat> in the legislative process um, due to the underhanded legislative skills of Eric Stein and others, um, magically, that same authority appeared over at the FTC. Uh, and um, I wonder um, 
whether Rohit, you can comment on this. It's, a, it's sort of a, a funny situation. You have the FTC, which generally doesn't have usable rule writing authority uh, in many areas, most areas. Uh, but in this one area, they've got really clear authority. <coughs> it's the only thing where you have really easy ways to write rules. Um, I'm wondering if you comment on why hasn't the FTC run with this authority to um, regulate lending in the auto dealer market? Well, it's a, let me give context on one thing, that the FTC, generally speaking, cannot get civil penalties unless there's a violation of an existing order or a rule. So what, what bugs me is that even when we find misconduct today, because we have no rule on the book, we cannot seek civil penalties. So even if we were to simply restate our existing policy, we could turn this on uh, and, and really change the market. And it's pretty disappointing that it's been nine years. Uh, it's been disappointing to me that we haven't done that. But it is something that I want to push for. Uh, let me give big picture on auto we are seeing something weird going on. So since 2010, we are seeing a dramatic run up of outstanding auto loans. I think we had a, a blockbuster year of auto lending uh, in, in 2018. And something that is important is technology is really changing this. So many of you may know about GPS trackers, kill switches, other repo tech. This is making it a lot easier to snatch a car uh, when the borrower doesn't pay. And the net result is that there's lenders out there who are able to give a loan even if they know it won't be repaid because they know they're going to be able to take that car back. I, I hope everyone has seen the John Oliver uh, segment about a car that was you know, sold and repossessed so many times but that's when a lender knows that they don't, they don't, it doesn't even matter if that, if that borrower crashes and burns. And, and this should be a real worry for us because an automobile is, the vehicle, is literally the vehicle in which you can get to employment, in which you can access health care, in which you can actually be, participate in society for the vast majority of America. So if we're seeing repossessions of what, of what we're seeing, if we're seeing auto loan delinquencies at a rates at rates we're looking at, we should we should be alarmed and we should not sit around and do nothing like we did with student debt. You know, it's the same story over and over. We saw it in mortgage, we saw it in student lending, we're seeing it in auto. And then add on top of that, subprime auto is disproportionately affecting people of color. Uh, it is disproportionately affecting the zip codes that are lower income. And you know, those are places that don't necessarily have the political power to demand certain types of change. So uh, I, I think that if, if we don't do anything about it, if the CFPB doesn't do anything about it, then you know we're going to need the states to really ramp up on this. And, and the thing that I worry about is there's not going to be a crisis um, to the banks on this. You know, uh, auto lending is not going to threaten their capital adequacy. There's they they have. Uh, the ability to keep repossessing and doing it cheaply uh, is, is not going to threaten them. So it's going to be about how do we better protect consumers, not how we protect the adequacy, capital adequacy of financial institutions. So I, I hope that we can uh, make big progress on this uh, and at some point actually use that authority because absent using that authority, we are not going to ever fix this, I think. Do you think, um, given, given what you just said, should there be some kind of uh, ability to repay rule in autos? And, and what can the FTC do, if anything, about the um, long experience of discrimination in auto lending markets? <coughs> yeah, so uh, many of you may know that the FTC also enforces the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. We have not brought a case in a very, very, very long time. Uh, and that uh, there was obviously uh, some efforts at the CFPB to, to go after that. I, I, we have to deal with discrimination in auto lending. I, 
I personally feel that uh, there needs to be more data uh, about uh, auto lending outcomes and, and, and the more data we have, the better we can bring those cases and better we can combat it. Um, you know, with respect to what a rule could look like, you know, I think putting some common sense rules that not only document our existing enforcement record of what we know to already be unlawful so that we can get that penalty authority, but also to make sure that uh, we don't have the type of abuse that allows a business model and a market failure to persist. So I don't know what that would look like, but it needs to be on people's radars. And I think it needs to be on our radars before the economy sours. Uh, rather than too late. So let's um, let's turn to small business markets. Um, there's been uh, dramatic changes in the small business markets um, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, with a, a very wide variety of um, bank and non-bank um, participants, uh, rise of um, of different kind of lending techniques. Uh, some of those have positively uh, increased access to capital for small businesses who were not able to obtain it before. Uh, but uh, there's also been a rise of business lending activities that are reminiscent of the kind of subprime mortgage um, uh, uh, lending that we saw in the lead up to the crisis with uh, very complicated terms, uh, very difficult to, um, uh, to compare uh, uh, terms across uh, loan offers. Mo most of you know this, but there's no, no <coughs> Truth in Lending Act um, for small business lending. Um, what could the FTC or other regulators be doing uh, to clean up this marketplace and help the high road players, as you described before, in, in, in the um, auto context? But how can we help the high road players um, thrive? How can we protect consumers? What in a big picture sense, whether from the FTC or otherwise, should we be doing in this space? Yeah, so uh, let me make a few points on this. First, uh, it is already very, very difficult for small businesses to form and compete. You know, for the past 35 years, we've seen a secular decline of new business formation, and I think part of that is due to massive consolidation in sectors across the economy. It is much harder for a smaller firm to enter uh, because of the big, it's hard, hard to compete with the big guys and that's a major antitrust question that we have to confront. But uh, small business lending in the non-bank sector really is the exclusive jurisdiction of the FTC. The CFPB does not have uh, authority to, to deal with this. The CFPB does have some direction to do some data collection around it, but not really to enforce the, the broad set of laws. So few problems I see. One, I think we're seeing a massive increase in payday style small business loans. So the way often this works is uh, you have a small business, whether it's a restaurant or a retailer, they are collecting a lot of their revenues through credit card receipt, through credit card transactions. Uh, and you have lenders who essentially offer short, very short-term loans that are secured by those credit card receivables. So it's just like uh, a, a payday loan in some ways. You know, the terms and conditions you see, many of you have heard that they include terms like confessions of judgment, things that were banned by the FTC credit practices rules 30 years ago, but that do not cover small business loans. I think the, the, there are now around $15 billion of origination uh, in these uh, payday style small business loans. So this obviously is gonna target um, some of our most vulnerable um, you know, individuals. I also think that it's not just a typical small business, that it might also be gig workers, um, other workers who might be independent contractors or, you know, having a, 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 their primary income not tied to traditional employment. So we at the FTC, we're going to be holding um, a forum on this, but I hope that it, it lays the groundwork for more data and more enforcement 
and as appropriate, I think there will need to be um, greater awareness about how these types of lending models are infecting uh, various parts of, of our financial economy. I mean, again, I hate to say it, we've seen this before, so let's not pretend to be surprised by it. Um, it has the same interface with capital markets, the same interface where uh, these these loans are are um, bundled and and sold and and transacted on, and it, it is not a small small. It's not a bunch of small little players. There is connectivity to Wall Street, and if we if we don't call it out for what it is, then uh, it's just going to get worse. And I I I, I don't want us to just keep repeating. Um, you know, frankly, what we missed and what we failed at before. So the um, the confessions of judgment um, uh, approach seems uh, particularly egregious. This is where uh, businesses basically give up their right to contest um, whether or not they're in default on their um, on their loan uh, in advance in the contract, uh, which is becoming increasingly um, deployed. Um, I wonder if you think that there are strategies within the existing. Um, legal system within the existing set of rules to attack that of course problem. there is i mean these are confessions of judgment were were banned in um consumer credit contracts uh, for the most part through the credit practices rules that i believe were finalized in the 1980s so there is existing authority to do it uh whether there's the courage and the and the will and the um the the tenacity to get it done you know that's what we have to push for and i think that needs a lot more people pushing our agencies and don't don't just assume that we'll do nothing but uh we have to hear from people about where the problems are in the market or will not get solved so i think this raises a, a larger question about uh junk contract clauses um, and one of the things that I think we need to start thinking about is we often attack these clauses one by one um, but we need to start thinking bigger picture about what are the types of contract terms that are fundamentally unfair um, and how do we use the existing authority under federal and state law to go after that because when when a when a seller or a lender has so much market power or so much ability to obscure uh, terms, you know, this can lead to uh, contracts that, have, uh, that are corrupted uh, by these contract terms. So we've, we've t you know, there's been big fights over the years about uh, forced arbitration. There's been big fights about other terms. But I think we have to look at a comprehensive view about how contracts where there's a big guy on one side and a little guy on the other, how do we how do we change that game? Because we cannot be on a treadmill of going after these contract terms one by one because new ones will pop up um, and we'll still still be staying behind. So we, we need to we need to get um, we need to get more scholarship on how to reform these contracts, and we have to think of it in a bigger picture of our law enforcement and regulatory approach. Uh, because when, when, when powerful firms are able to, uh, they, they, they use contracts, they use um, their market power to essentially bully out fair competition, and, and it, it, that's, that's, not what a, that's not what a free and fair market is supposed to look like. I've always been struck that um, the behavioral economics literature has made this huge progress on the consumer side. You know, we now understand a lot more about human decision making, um, the way in which human beings are fallible, and how the market um, can take advantage of that fallibility. We seem not to have made much progress translating that same set of ideas for business owners. So most small business owners are um, just to state the obvious, people. Um, and most people have biases whether they're, and, and fallibility whether they're serving as a business or as a consumer. And most small businesses are not big enough to hire accountants and lawyers and, and the other expertise they need. 
there's been some progress recently on this at the state level. So California has a Truth in Lending Act now um, for small businesses. I'm wondering whether you think that's a, a route forward as we're trying to make progress at the federal level. Um, should states be following California lead? Are there other things states can be doing to be helpful in this space? Yeah, I, I well, I f uh, favor disclosure, but I, I don't want anyone thinking that disclosure fundamentally fixes some of this. So, you know, th th those are good efforts, and I think other states are looking at similar things. But, you know, you mentioned that uh, small businesses, people who run small businesses are people. They're also consumers. We're seeing the same thing with uh, workers, so employees um, having some of these clauses in fine print that are fundamentally, uh, you know, lead to problems in how the, and and we've done some cases uh, related to Uber drivers and uh, you know with respect to financing and and um, you know promises being made to them about how much they've earned. But we got to take a hard look at all of these uh, contracts, and I hope that you know that is something that is not just going to be solved by disclosure, but at a certain point, that certain types of terms are just we can't have a competitive market if those exist. Uh, confessions of judgment is not going to lead to a competitive market if someone has to stipulate that they're guilty, uh, you know, when they when at the beginning of the transaction. That's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to your point about the gig economy, but I think it, it, it is um, illustrative of the way in which the line between being a person and being a business is quite um, blurry. fuzzy, blurry. Um, let's, um, let's switch gears and talk about um, credit bureaus. Um, it's hard to find a regular consumer who's really excited about the credit bureaus uh, in a positive way. Uh, lots of people have problems with um, correcting errors. Um, uh, they're trapped up in a variety of ways. We have the uh, authority for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to supervise the bureaus. The FTC has some authority here as well. What can be done to really change the behavior of the um, of the credit bureaus? Yeah, and and one of the um, one of the things I think that has been underreported has been um, how uh, positive the role of CFPB supervision on the credit bureaus has been. I think there has uh, th that has changed the way uh, the credit bureaus are thinking about things. But at the same time, there are still serious problems. Uh, and it's not just accuracy. Obviously, the FTC um, has publicly announced that we are investigating um, the massive data breach at Equifax uh, and and the implications of that for for consumers. So, you know, data security is obviously a key focus of the FTC. The CFPB has amassed a really strong team of people who have expertise in, in credit reporting. But I think there's a bigger question here, which we need to start thinking about, which is competition. Uh, I always say this, and many others say it too, consumers are not the customer of credit bureaus, they're the product. You know, they're, it's their data that is being sold and transacted, uh, and this is increasingly what's happening in our data economy. Uh, what we have, what we see online is massive data collection on us to monetize us through online behavioral advertising. We have data brokers. The FTC did a very, very thorough um, study of data brokers a few years ago. And the, the credit bureaus, the data brokers, big, uh, big technology firms, they are sort of merging uh, in, their, in their business model in that they are selling us uh, to others. And that's, that's something that we have to ask some hard questions about is how are there going to be the right types of competitive pressures to lead to better practices? And I'm not sure the way w the credit bureau market is structured that we'll ever get that. And I think our, our traditional thinking has been, let's regulate it. But if that's not working, maybe we need to think about 
bigger structural solutions. You know, in other OECD countries, there's a lot of different models for how credit reporting works. Uh, should there be, would we be better off with more credit bureaus? That, that I don't know. Um, but we need to, if, if there's not going to be, if there's a race to the bottom that there's more profits essentially for underinvesting in fair treatment of consumers, um, that's, that, that, that we have to think about. So on a secondary level, there's a lot of lingering issues about the appropriateness and, and of uses of, of credit, credit reporting data. So I think obviously the use in uh, employment, the use in tenant screening, these, these all raise tough issues. Uh, and I'm not really sure if our current regime of encouraging people to check their reports is really working if you can't easily dispute and correct. I mean, I, I'm, I am really skeptical that I'm not sure we should even be allowing medical debt on credit reports. You know, there's so much garbage medical debt that is put on people's credit reports. And the reality is most consumers are just in this ping pong match that they're watching between the provider and their insurance company. Then one day they're called and they said, oh yeah, you owe this bill. Um, and for most people, you know, they're not, they're not professional consumer advocates. Um, they, might not be, they might not know how to navigate that. And I'll tell you, you know, for those of us who, you know, have a lot of patient experience, you also, you feel some sort of embarrassment with your doctor if you're on some list as you're not paying. So I think a lot of people end up just writing that check or, or, or charging that even when they don't really owe it because they're being jerked around by both the insurance company and in some cases the credit bureau. Now, the CFPB study on medical debt and credit scores, I think, definitely helped because people are not, it's not being reported immediately, it's not necessarily impacting their score. But even if it does get reported, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure the value it gives other than maybe coercing someone to pay up. So there's a long list of issues. Um, I am not pleased at all at the state of credit reporting still, but I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss the massive leaps forward that the CFPB has led. Uh, but there, there's, there's definitely more work to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope the credit bureaus know that at, we are still taking a hard look, um, you know, at their business practices. And let me just say one more time, we are seeing that they are increasingly looking more like data brokers and, you know, mass at data aggregators. Uh, it's more than just Fair Credit Reporting Act covered, covered activities. So let's, um, let's dive in just for a few minutes on student loans. We're going to have a whole um, discussion, Wade, Wade Henderson's talk, and then a, a panel discussion on student loans. But <coughs> given your experience at both Department of Education and CFPB on these issues, really, you really pushed uh, both entities quite hard on uh, the problems in the for-profit uh, college market and student loans more broadly. Um, what progress has been made? You know, where do you see the pitfalls? What are we going to do about it? Yeah. So in, you know, two minutes or less. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. So we still have, um, we still have about once every 30 seconds someone defaulting on a federal student loan. This is thousands a day. And wh what I'm concerned about is we're not actually seeing delinquency or default rates really slow down even as the economy gets better. So this suggests that you still have a huge amount of borrowers who are burdened with this debt um, and are really not able to get the value out of, out of that degree. So I reject this uh, singular focus on getting more students to complete college. I, don't, I think that's good, but we need to really think about the existing one and a half trillion that's out there. I think the Corinthian college scandals have really opened people's eyes about whether this was just a fundamentally, uh, fundamentally corrupt system from beginning to end and, and whether we need to be thinking much more broadly about cancellation 
um, not just for those who were victimized, but those who were set up to fail uh, from the beginning. So I think you're going to start seeing over the next year much bigger discussion about student debt cancellation, where we knew it was it was screwed up from the beginning. Um, there's going to have to be discussion about completely rethinking the student loan origination system because if if if, if we're going to allow this to continue, it is only going to have more negative repercussions for our economy and our society. And and I, I'll tell you. I think a lot of people who graduated or came of age around the time of the financial crisis, they were, they were in college. I mean, I can't tell you, we've, so many of us have met, met students who told us, well, you know, uh, you know my, my parents were laid off or we lost our home and now it's all on me to pay for this. And you know, sophomore year of college, what are you gonna do? You're gonna borrow big um, and hope it all works out, but the structure of our economy doesn't work this way. And look look at, at schools like Michigan. I mean, even here, a state school, some people have to borrow big to go to law school, to go to graduate school, and, and it really skews how they think about their career path. Um, and and that, that has some real repercussions. So let's, um, let's turn to um, service members, military members. Um, you know, in the in the financial crisis, and and as we were thinking about the Dodd Frank Act and the CFPB, kind of one of the issues front and center for us was the way in which service members had really been abused um, on around military bases or during overseas deployments. The CFPB was given important authorities in this area. You know, are how much are service members still at risk? Are you seeing problems in the market that you think we should be focused on? Yeah, so you still, you obviously see a very different um, set of demographics of the force than you did 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's not a, as much of a wartime force than it was, but you still see, uh, you know, many young, uh, often from lower income backgrounds, uh, especially men, uh, being off on their own and being heavily targeted, uh, not just by, by a, whole, a whole suite of, of you know, unscrupulous actors. Now, what is good is that I think the results of the Military Lending Act have been very, very positive, that you're, you're seeing, um, you know, big improvements there. You know, we mentioned auto earlier. We still have big problems in the auto market with respect to um, service members. So I think that has to be a big focus for the FTC and for the states. Uh, the Service Member Civil Relief Act you know, we, sh we should all take serious pause at not only, uh, the illegal foreclosures got a lot of attention, um, but you know, the Santander case uh, where, you know, someone while at basic training, uh, getting their car taken from them illegally, uh, you know, it's just egregious. And I, 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 I worry that we have not calibrated correctly the right types of consequences for that behavior. Um, and we need to start thinking about what types of government benefits, licenses, favors are we giving these firms that when they egregiously break the law, you know, is a monetary fine enough? Um, and, you know, how many times do you have to break the law uh, before we start thinking about what do we do with your license? What do we do with, um, you know, some of the government benefits you get? And I think that's, that's one of the only ways we're going to deter some of these bad actors. We, we actually have a great, a lot of great work at the FTC with respect to lead generation targeting um, military uh, service members and veterans. And I think focusing hard on uh, these lead generators is going to pay dividends. Let me, um, let me ask you a, a question about um, something really not in the FTC's jurisdiction at all, but I'm sure you've had a chance to think about it, and that's, that's Wells Fargo. Um, in many ways, kind of a a, a, um, a prime example of the kind of abuses that can happen in the in the retail banking market. Uh, how do you think that the <coughs> federal regulators have dealt with Wells Fargo so far? Has it been enough? What are the further steps you think might be useful? Yeah. So, one of my earliest priorities when I got to the FTC was sharpening our focus on repeat offenders um, and viola violators of, of consent decrees and other orders. So, you know, you have a, 
a very good example here of a firm that um, had ser has serious managerial deficiencies and compliance deficiencies. And obviously the CFPB and the city attorney of LA, uh, the fake accounts scandal that was uncovered, I mean, it has literally been over and over again, more and more and more problems that we've been hearing. And I think the big lesson that all of us have to take from this is, are we fundamentally miscalibrating monetary penalties? Um, are monetary penalties, those, pen those penalties that make for a good uh, regulator's press release, is it actually just a joke sometimes? Um, now, obviously, I think we have some agencies that really use their authorities and seek, seek an amount that is highly justifiable in the courts. But I, you know, I, I look at someone like Wells Fargo, and you know, I'm, I, I have wondered, you know, with all these fake accounts, you know, should we really be trusting them with FDIC insurance the way we are doing so and I'm not saying uh, you know it raises all sorts of too big to fail issues but the the FDI act is quite clear that for this repeated unsafe and unsound business practices uh, you know this is not something that the public's deposit insurance should necessarily be protecting so I think thinking more about uh, the other levers that we have I think the Fed's action um, to you know, lead to some real governance changes, um, changing up the board, these type of structural remedies uh, that fundamentally reshape executive compensation, governance, and access to these government benefits has to be part of that pool. So you know, this is not something I've studied so closely, but I think the experience we're having in Wells Fargo it's signaling to to so many of the agencies that the public is going to become more skeptical just about these billion dollar numbers. Um, and they're not gonna see the sort of changes until we think about other types of structural remedies. And, and, and I think, again, it goes to fundamental incentives, um, structure of those business models, and, and Wells Fargo, like many, you know, it's a bank with a, a federal charter that gets federal deposit insurance um, and, and benefits really greatly from those, from those benefits. So, you know, we should ask questions again. Um, are, we, are we giving those benefits too freely um, when, when we have repeated problems that are just that need to get solved so let me ask um, one last question and I'm going to open it up to all of you um, for questions um, I, and I want to come back to your your comment on the gig economy and, and tech companies in general and um, <coughs> talk about the competition policy side of the house at the FTC so there's been uh, all kinds of um, uh, stories coming out about uh, anti-competitive behavior in the tech sector. And one particular problem uh, that's, that's risen uh, uh, to the top is uh, non-compete agreements for workers in the tech economy. I'm wondering what effect you think that's having on competition in tech. Is it fair? Are there things that the FTC or others can or should do about it? Yes, yeah, so non-compete agreements, uh, there's been more and more data uh, and research, uh, including um, by Alan Kruger, about really how non-competes may be distorting a competitive labor market, that it may actually be suppressing wages uh, for especially many of our lowest income workers. The Illinois Attorney General, the Washington Attorney General, others have actually uh, done some enforcement work in this to, and have declared the use of some of these clauses as as uh, a violation of their uh, mini FTC Act, their their state unfair uh, business practices act. So, uh, I I raised in an article uh, in September as to whether the FTC should uh, consider using its unfair methods of competition rulemaking mm -hmm. to develop the law 
um, and offer more clarity as to when the use of these non-compete clauses may be a violation of federal law. So it, it is something that they're proliferating, uh, and if we don't do anything about it, we are not going to see a competitive labor market. You know, with respect to tech, uh, one thing that I think is important for your center and for um, you know students who are thinking about uh, finance, law, and policy is the line between financial services and tech is also blurring a lot. Uh, the way in which big data is being used for alternative underwriting, the way in which technology firms are increasingly entering the financial services space, some of it is good, some of it raises some real questions about how that data is going to be used or misused. So we have to, everyone who's interested in a fair financial market has got to be thinking about our surveillance and data economy too. Um, and for everyone who cares about a competitive financial services market, they also have to wake up um, and start asking harder questions. Are we doing enough with respect to our antitrust laws with financial services firms? Um, the Federal Reserve uh, and the Department of Justice, you know, take the lead on banking mergers, but there's all sorts of other uh, financial services mergers that, that really need a lot more scrutiny. And I think we're now seeing big bank mergers again. Uh, after the Dodd-Frank DREG bill, we have, we're, we're now seeing larger banks seeking to merge. I think that's going to continue. Um, and we need, to, we need to determine whether we are using all the tools we have uh, to make sure those markets are competitive and that community banks and others are able to compete. That's great. So let me, uh, let me open it up to all of you. Pat. Pat, could you just wait for the mic to arrive yeah, to you? Absolutely. We have folks watching online. Can you, is this on? It was for you. It was on. It was on. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to uh, run by you a couple of topics. Um, um, I, I, I'd be curious about your take on the state of the effectiveness of ECOA today. ECOA has always been a difficult statute <coughs> to enforce. And now, now we have the concern that the disparate impact theory is endangered. Uh, that's one, one question. And the other is, if the CFPB adopts a regulatory sandbox for FinTech and perhaps some other things, what would be the interaction of that CFPB sandbox with the FTC's jurisdiction? Yeah, good, that's a good question. So uh, I think, frankly, all of our anti-discrimination laws, they really need, we, they were not designed for this mass data surveillance economy. So if we look at what's happening, uh, it's not just in the underwriting of credit. Uh, what, what ads, not for housing, employment, for products, it's not like you're opening the newspaper. The newspaper, those ads are now customized to you. Um, and with, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and, all, and algorithms, it is fundamentally a different world where it's not necessarily a human um, intentionally discriminating, but the algorithm itself may be discriminatory, but we have no real way to check for that because it may be relying on artificial intelligence and, and evolving on its own. So, you know, the ECOA framework, I'm, I, I, I obviously want us to use it to, to every, every bit we can, um, and obviously that means using disparate impact theory, but uh, I'm not sure that law syncs up well with 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 the data economy today and I, I hope that when the next financial reform comes or when we start talking for real about uh, accountability in, in tech and big data that that becomes a centerpiece of it not just in credit but in all these other economic opportunities now with respect to the sandbox 
Um, that is a real open question. Uh, you know, the CFPB certainly has, you know, uh, special authorities with respect to ECOA, but, uh, you know, the FTC enforces that. So I think that's really to be determined. And I, I, I get these, the attraction to these sandboxes, but it's very important that it just does not become the side door to essentially deregulating the whole thing. And, and that is something that we need to pay very, very close attention to because there is a lot of opportunity for abuse in it. And that means that we're going to have to make sure that anyone who's benefiting from it is really going to be held accountable for producing a lot of data, producing uh, and adhering to the highest standards. So, you know, I, I, I have worked in online lending and in, in, you know, innovative financial you know, technologies, but I'm not so sure that, uh, I, I see both sides, but I, I'm skeptical as to uh, whether that's going to lead to the benefits that they think it will. I have a question. Um, I just looked up a statistic, 15% of Americans smoke. Um, there's, you know, rampant alcohol abuse, um, people make bad choices, bad decisions, bad behavior. How do you, in, the, in making policy, account for people just doing bad stuff that you tell them they shouldn't do, but they do it anyway, and then you have to have a policy that protects them? Well, I think we have to start with just the idea of we can't let people be lied to. So you know, when it comes to tobacco use, we have a history in this country of essentially people being lied to. Uh, you know, with opioid abuse, there's now serious, we're now learning more and more about how a big corporation concealed and even lied. So I start there. Um, but your, your question about how to, how to nudge people into better decisions, there's, you know, a lot of literature on that. But I still think uh, we have to make sure that there are real consequences when people are being lied to. Uh, and one of the things I have, you know, not been thrilled about is the amount of settlements that the FTC enters that are zero dollar. Mm -hmm. These kind of no consequences settlements, the free pass, I understand and, and fully recognize that there's some of that may be related to limited authorities we have, but some of it uh, is just backwards in terms of how we are trying to, to hold accountable those who do lie. So I don't know if that's responsive, but that's, that's the instinct I have is that's our first priority, but then there's lots of other tools outside of law enforcement uh, to try and help people make better decisions. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'd like to take that actually a step further. So <clears throat> when we talk about justice in our country and we talk about humans, it seems like we come from this point of view here where uh, how far can we punish someone until it's just unacceptable to society? But when it's a business, we are constantly talking about what's the least amount we can do to get the change we want, right? So we come from these two different points of view, whether it's a business or whether it's a human being. <coughs> and even when you know, you're know you talking or anyone's talking, I feel like, about financial justice, um, towards business practice, uh, we talk in a metered language. And I just wonder, how do we change that paradigm where we feel like we can be draconian, that we feel like we can really lay a hammer down? We, what are the hurdles that you know, we run into that we don't run into with humans? We have no problem putting humans away to jail for extremely long periods of time in our country, but you know, we can't go after banks. We can't deal with these companies. Yeah, well, I mean, it's in some ways the obvious political power of, you know, our, our most influential and wealthiest citizens and firms that are able to distort the justice system in their favor. So I don't know how to solve that one, but you're right that I, I, I think that if we are not, it, it goes to what I said about those, uh, regulator press releases, you know, a billion dollars is a tremendous amount of money, but is it a tremendous amount of money for 
you know, some of the largest firms on the planet. Um, and is paying that fine sometimes a gamble that it was worth taking? So t again, what I, what I go back to is we need to keep thinking about is a monetary remedy going to solve it? And in some ways, especially for those who repeatedly break the law, do you need to go to courts um, and do you need authorities to fundamentally fix the structural incentive that leads them to do that? I mean, again, I think that goes to executive compensation, it goes to board governance, and it goes to especially individual liability. So we, we recently um, had a, had a ch children's privacy case, and uh, Commissioner Slaughter and I uh, spoke up about the need for, in these cases of very serious misconduct, this was a case involving uh, essentially the disclosure of very sensitive data about young children that was available to people. Um, and, you know, the, the company decided to let it go on. Uh, and the question then becomes is, is the penalty, is the fine to the company right? Or do we need to really sharpen our focus on the role of individuals um, and individual accountability? Um, until we start doing that more, um, you know, that's not going to really change the structural incentives and behavior. A, a, a couple of just, so I, I worked, I was on a board of directors in the UK. And the only thing I learned from being on the board of directors of a company in the UK was their company's house, our, our SEC, tells you that you're pretty permissive as to what you can do, except for if your company becomes insolvent, the directors are personally liable. And, and, and we've, we've taken away the personal liability of managers and directors through insurance and other things. I mean. You talk about Wells Fargo, uh, the CEO paid a billion dollars in fines last year and got a 5% raise. He's making $18.5 million. <coughs> when do we get to the point where when corporations do bad things, you know, and, and maybe it's pulling their license, but the other alternative is, which is what I heard a lot during the uh, financial crisis, why didn't we lock anybody up? Are there, do we have the ability to do criminal prosecutions for crimes, whether they be at the CFPB or the FTC? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a criminal prosecutor, but I think that is certainly, if we look at what happened in the savings and loan scandal, a, a lot of people went to prison, um, and, and that didn't happen this last time. Obviously, criminal law is something that is also part of the policy toolkit of the extent to which certain things should be subject to criminal penalties. Uh, you know, as a civil law enforcement agency, I still think that even civil law enforcement that targets individuals does something. I don't think it's criminal or nothing. Um, and that's an important piece of really what we should be doing. So I, I'll tell you, the FTC, we name individuals a lot uh, for small scammers. But I'm not so sure that we should assume that a large firm uh, shouldn't necessarily have the same level of scrutiny. So I don't know the answer to your question. My gut tells me that we did not use the criminal authorities as vigorously as we should have. I'll make another point. You know, if we look at um, Theranos, uh, if we look at um, even Corinthian and ITT, Corinthian and ITT might be known to many of you in this room, it, they are, were large pu publicly traded firms that the CFPB sued. They are both now uh, defunct. You know, the, the leadership of those firms engaged in billions of dollars of, of harm 
to so many students. Uh, and the only real personal accountability they faced was, you know, an, an $80,000 fine by the SEC. And, and it, what, what kills me is that you can do, uh, you can really take advantage and lie and cheat consumers and nothing really happens to you personally, but, if, but, but how dare you uh, lie to an investor? Um, and if you lie to an investor, boy, are you going to be personally held accountable for that often. So I think we sometimes need to think about whether that, whether massive fraud against consumers, you know, are, are we, do we have that calibration right? What is it gonna take for us to regulate Google? I listened to the hearings on C-SPAN and it, I was struck by the fact that you're not going to get decent legislation if it seemed like many of the members of Congress need a tutorial on the field to be asking the right questions even. Yeah, so um, just to give you a sense, six of the ten largest uh, corporations by market capitalization are either American or Chinese technology firms. This is a dramatic change. Um, you know, many people here might think about the valuation of large financial institutions. Those firms eclipse them by far. So I guess my reaction to you is I don't really think uh, you need to be a technologist or a computer scientist to know how to put into place regulations for some of these firms. Our regulations have to be rooted in our values about what we think is fair in terms of, you know, what Professor McCoy asked about discrimination, what uh, comes about with privacy and the use of our data. So obviously we want to be driven by evidence, but, uh, you know, on both sides of the aisle, People are uncomfortable, not just in their heads, but in their hearts, about some of the practices that are uh, that they see, especially with mass data aggregation online, and especially how that data can be used to block new market entrants um, and to monetize consumers, and 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 in some ways, that leads to real threats to our journalism industry, to our democracy, to our national security. You know, data security is a big focus. Um, and data security, many of our largest data breaches, uh, these are assets that are, are being targeted by, by foreign state actors because they know this rich set of data being collected about us has real value. So. I don't know if, uh, of course, we want our legislators to be smart about the questions to ask, but I don't, I, I don't want anyone thinking that uh, you have to be a computer scientist or a technologist to engage in this debate. All of us should be able to engage in this debate no matter how we participate in the economy. Shy group this morning. <laughs> no, there's yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask about <clears throat> these sorts of, uh, I guess, services that say that they're going to help consumers, you know, manage their credit better. A credit Karma is a big example that I can think of. Are these, I guess, helping consumers understand? I, like I'm a user, and I, you know, there's certainly some things that I've learned. Or are they, I guess, doing more harm than good by? collecting a lot of that information, such as they offer free filing, but they then say they're going to use that information to market, you know, financial services to you. What are your thoughts on things like that? Yeah, I, I think that in the next few years, we're going to have to switch our definition of the word free. So free, a lot of things are offered for free. Um, but they're actually a real exchange, and I wouldn't even call it a fair exchange. I would sometimes call it, you know, offering something for free, but pickpocketing someone and then selling what you took from them. Because uh, it's not clear at all to consumers what is being taken from them. 
uh, the ability the ability uh, of for this to even get more complicated when we make the transition to 5g and for for 5g is going to have speeds um, for mobile communications in ways that we see only for fixed and that is going to lead to a huge blossoming of internet of things and and more wearable devices and connected cars and the amount of information that is going to be available on us um, that automotive companies can collect that that retailers can collect um, it's going to lead to more personalized pricing which raises a whole other set of competitive issues and consumer protection issues so we are just we i am very worried that we are not up to speed as state and federal regulators on the implications of this for our economy and our society. So, you know, I don't know what the answer is specifically to those specific firms, but if we don't change our thinking on the word free quickly, uh, I don't, I think it's just going to lead to a lot of delayed action that is long overdue. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking Rohit Chopra.